There's no such thing as a bad market. It's either a buyer's market or it's a seller's market. And so you just need to figure out who you are in that cycle. I had a Houston investor one time and he told me something, I'll never forget it. He said, you know, I've always sold too soon. And I thought about that and I thought, how wise a statement is that? Because the problem is if you wait for the top, the truth of the matter is once you hit the top, it's too late. Hello, left fielders. Welcome to the Passive Investing from Left Field podcast. Our community is focused on networking and education to help people invest passively and think differently. Let's go. I'm really honored and excited today to have Joe Williams with us. He is the co-founder of Keller Williams. He started as one of the youngest real estate agents in Texas and built Keller Williams into the largest real estate company in the U.S. It's an amazing story. Keller Williams has been recognized as one of the top training organizations in the world, best employer for new graduates, best for diversity, most innovative, Forbes list of world's best employers, and so much more. It's a great company. Uh, They also have a commercial real Real estate uh, operation that Joe helped start in 2008, and that is alive and kicking as well. So, Joe, welcome to the Passive Investing from Left Field podcast. Jim, good to be here, man. Good to see you. you. You're looking good since I last saw you in California. Thank you. So, so are you? I know you had a little uh, racquetball incident. I'm glad that you're all healed up and ready to go. <laughs> you're right. I feel a lot better today. Trust me. Oh, that's good. That's good. So the first question I always ask is, what's your journey? And as I said, you started at age 19, and I'd just love to hear about how you got into real estate and then anything you want to share about how you started Keller Williams and, and just the, the journey from there. You know, it's funny when when you talk to entrepreneurs, Jim, how they all ended up doing what they're doing. You know, it's, it, it, and my journey is no different. I was working, you know, my dad died when I was 10 years old. So my mom had three kids, my older sister, myself, my younger brother. And so at a very early age, we all went to work. Uh, And nobody thought that was a bad thing. It was a good thing. All through high school, I worked retail. And a great Jewish family, Mel and Becky always, really good. And I got to know their son, Steve, great guy. That's where I learned to sell. Those guys, they know how to sell. And uh, I got into a a university interscholastic league contest uh, because I was in distributive education my senior year of high school. And that's where you worked half a day and you went to school half a day. Okay. And they would give you credit for that. So... Anyhow, I did really well in the sales demonstration contest, and I remember talking to my mom about it, and my mother managed beauty shops. You know, today you'd call that a hairstylist, right? (laughs) And her customers, who were most consistent, were, guess what? The real estate ladies who came in every week to have their hair done. And so my mom's talking to them about Oh, my son just won this sales demonstration contest, blah, blah, blah. And they all told her, Bertie, you need to get that boy into real estate. And as crazy as it sounds, Jim, that is today why I am (laughs) in real estate. My mom came home. She said, honey, have you ever thought about selling real estate? Well, I didn't even know what the word meant. I'm like, well, what is that? I mean, you know, I'm. It's, you know, 18 years old. She says, well, you know, houses, buildings, we call it real estate. Oh, okay. And happened to work at the store and one of our best customers, uh, this is a toy store I worked at. Okay. And we had this huge hobby counter. So this broker, Tony Specia, bless his heart, great guy. He had two boys. He was always coming in the store, and they were buying hobbies. So I knew I knew Tony well. And I said, Tony, can I ask you about, tell me about the real estate business? And that's when he said, you know, uh, why don't you come down to my office, Joe, and we can talk all about it. Well, he'd known me for two years. I mean, he knew I could sell. 
And I feel like he felt, hey, I could confidently hire this guy and turn him into a real estate guy. And so that's that's how it got started in real estate at 19 years old, because we found out if your mother was a widower at the age of 19, you could get contractual majority in the state of Texas. Otherwise, I would have had to wait wait until I was 21 years old. So I I started in San Antonio. I was a sophomore in college, finished up junior college. And then I was looking around trying to figure out, is there a place that I can get a degree in real estate from a major university? Well, it turns out University of Texas had just started a real estate program at their business school. So that's what brought me to Austin. And I was here for about two and a half years, finished up, went to work for a broker who had gone to the same high school as me. I knew his brother really well. And the gentleman's name was J.B. Goodwin. His brother Guy and I were very good friends. And Guy used to see me at UT and say, man, you need to go to work for my brother. Well, that's exactly what I did. And after I was there for two or three years, I wrote an article about recruiting on the college campuses. And so that's where I met. Gary Keller. Gary was in the real estate department at Baylor University. And we went up there and we were interviewing. Now, I didn't interview Gary, a guy by the name of Sam Fitzgerald. He worked. Sam and I drove down up to Waco to do the interviews. But that's how Gary came to work at J.B. Goodman. So Gary and I worked together. We knew each other. And uh, had a lot of admiration for each other. Gary was a really good manager, good trainer. I love to train. I, I was primarily out there in sales. So one day Gary calls me up and we go to lunch. And he says, hey, I want to open up a real estate company. And I told him, I said, well, you could do that. I mean, you know the numbers. I yeah. could have done it. He could have done it. But he made a good case. He said, look, most of the real estate companies that I look around Austin – they're not one person, they're two. And, and in a way, it makes sense because, I mean, if you're ever going to go on vacation, who's going to watch the shop <laughs> if you're a lone broker? I mean, right. so the more I thought about it, the more it made a lot of sense. And so that's how we started Keller Williams. And that was 1983. By 1986, the Texas oil bust occurred, and it was bad. Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Colorado, literally got flushed down the financial toilet. I mean, there was, I mean, they talk about see-through buildings now. We were loaded with see-through office buildings. The S and L crisis occurred at the same oh, time. Right. The government stepped in, formed the Resolution Trust Corporation, the RTC, and just started closing down banks left and right. And it's interesting because they learned a lot of lessons from that. And when the big financial crunch hit again in 07, 08, 09, they didn't do that. They kind of learned their lesson not to just shut these banks down like that. Right. So, uh, but it was interesting because it was at that point that Gary and I really had to rethink the brokerage business. Because up till then, we were just a good company with good leaders and good agents. And, you know, we were just doing the Pepsi challenge. How can we make everything a little bit better? Right. But when the crunch hit, that's when he and I sat down and really started to look at the business and go, wait a minute. We need, we need to make some big fundamental changes, not so much impacting the buyers and the sellers. It had everything to do with how we as brokers interacted with our agents. And those were where we made those changes. And they were, we didn't realize they'd be so big at the time. And so by 89, we were having very good success. And so we decided to franchise the company. Because you can look at the history of real estate franchises, and that was the way to do it, whether it was Century 21 or our homes and gardens, whatever. There were some 
history behind the franchising model. And so that's what we did. And we started close by, uh, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, Louisiana, then we started to branch out. And by 93, we hired a very good guy, Bain Henyon. He came in and he sat down and he said, look, I love your ideas, but you guys don't know anything about franchising. And the truth, Jim, was he was right. I mean, we're just a couple of entrepreneurs going, hey, this is great. We'll spread this across the country, not realizing that a good franchise is based primarily on models and systems. And you really got to understand and have clarity as to where you're going and what your product really is. And then you've got to understand, how do you go get the best talented people to be your operating partners? That's the key to franchising. So he sat down and said, look, there's 10 steps that you have to follow if you really want to go find talented people. And when you think about it, people hire people all the time. But it's rare to get training in that specific task. And we looked at each other and said, you know, yeah. no one's ever shown me the 10-step process to go find talented people. Turns out that was a real game changer for us. And I can tell you because when 07, 08, 09, 10 hit and the Great Recession, you know, really just hammered everybody we're the only real estate company that grew. And I would tell you that happened because we had the best partners. That That's great. That's an amazing story. Now, the success of, I mean, you didn't just start Keller Williams and then, yeah, okay, you were, you were great salespeople and all of a sudden you're the largest uh, real estate company in, in the country, right? There's things that you changed and some of that was empowering agents and making your company agent uh, focused instead of just on the um, the real estate or the, the client or the owners of the business. And one of the things, the mission statement, right? I, I read the mission statement, build careers worth having, businesses worth owning, lives worth living. How did you get to that? Because that's your, in, in my mind, that is probably why, looking from the outside, the big growth that you had, because you put it on the agents and, and let them be almost business owners. And then you have this mission statement that says, hey, here's what we want. Is that what kind of fueled the growth? I mean, it's amazing, that, that yeah. mission statement. I just love it. That That's the real secret sauce. And, and let me explain. A, a very good friend of mine, Jim, he was an ER doctor. And I'll never forget what he said to me one day. He said, you know, Joe, hospitals don't have patients. Doctors do. But doctors can't function without a well-organized hospital. And... Gary and I kind of looked at ourselves and said, you know what? That's a great analogy for the real estate business. We as the broker, we don't have those customers and clients. Our agents do. But the agents really can't function without coming to us for some coaching and advice and guidance. So why don't we become the hospital? And Jim, you're going to be the guy you're going to be the doctor. Those customers and clients you have that want to buy and sell real estate, they belong to you. They don't belong to Gary and I. And Jim, let me tell you, that was a watershed moment because traditionally what brokers felt is that, hey, you work for me and I'm going to share commissions with you. But all of these people you're working with, they're really customers of the brokerage. And Gary and I said, nah, we don't think so. We think that if you're playing golf and you got three guys you're playing with in Ohio and you're getting transferred to New York City, you turn to those three guys and you go, hey guys, I'm gonna have to sell my house. Have you guys got any real estate people that you like? And that's exactly how people find real estate agents. They ask. 
And right. so our comment to the agents is, if that's indeed the case, why would we bother building the brand? What we need to do is build your brand. You need to become the face of the company. You need to keep these customers and clients. They're not ours, they're yours. So from now on, and this is just a small example, we looked at them and said, you know what? We're not gonna spend one dime on advertising. Starting from today, no more advertising by Keller Williams. Here's the trade-off though. Instead of you being on a 50-50 split, we're gonna give you back the money that we were spending on advertising by giving you a higher split. And so if you wanna go run an ad, go do it. You'll have the money. We just think you're better at figuring out where to put those dollars than we are. And yeah. the truth was, Jim, it was so obvious over time that if that was the case, they were very careful where they spent those dollars. Oh, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? No more of this, how oh, come I don't have a big ad in the paper? Well, number one, they're not very effective. And if you're spending the money, you're going to be very careful where you spend it. Yeah. And so what happened was we lowered our overhead substantially because we didn't buy their signs either. They bought their signs now. They bought their lock boxes. They handled everything. We just provided an office where they could come and work. And it was a better allocation of expense dollars. And they control their own budget. So we could give them much more of the money. And yeah. we got to a point, and it's not anything I could cover on a podcast, but it's huge. We got to where we were making so much money, Jim, with these offices, that we went back to the agents and said, hey, we think there's a way we can design a profit share program. Well, nobody had ever heard of this in the real estate brokerage industry. Right. But we said, we think we can tie it in with recruiting and being in a profitable office. And if we do this, as you recruit people into the company, we're going to pay you a small percentage of whatever the company would have made on any sales they made. And we let that flow for several levels. Now, people would say, oh, that sounds like a multi-level payout. Well, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> right. It was a multi-level payout, but it worked beautifully. In fact, today, I don't know what the final number is, but I believe we have paid over $1.5 billion in profit share back to our agent partners, which is unheard of. Just that's unheard crazy. Of. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's that, that's amazing. And, and when you explain it that way, looking back, you think, oh, it, it's kind of obvious that this is how the business should be run. But you don't know that until someone smart enough comes around and actually does it. And, and so I just think that's brilliant. The other thing that I think um, I've heard you talk about is – simplicity and clarity and why those are so important, not just in real estate, but in business. Can you talk a little bit about simplicity and clarity? Yeah. You know, I have a, I have a theory that I use called the stable table theory. Okay. And what it means is for most businesses, for most enterprises, You've normally got three, but most of the time, four variables that you need to get working in synergy with each other. And the theory is, if you have a table with one leg, how stable is it? Well, it's not. Two legs, it's still not. Three legs, it's a stool. But I would have <laughs> left my grandson on it. So if I've got a table with four legs, it's gonna work. Typically, for most businesses, the very first leg of that table, their table, needs to be clarity. Why are we in business? And what exactly 
do we do? And when you look at all the great businesses, an example I always give is uh, Google. Google, when you go to Google, you got to remember, years ago, when there were 30 search engines out there, hey, and you're old enough to remember this, Jim. <laughs> yeah. When you, when you went to Google, all you had was a box. And that was it. And yeah. you typed in that box what it is you wanted to do. It could be a question, could be an item. But Google made it so simple to understand how their search engine worked. And what happened? Well, they became the king. Yeah, they won. I mean, today, most, today most people use Google as their front-facing page on their computer. Now, it costs millions of dollars to get to that level of simplicity. But simplicity is the key. And again, for most businesses, for ours, it was very simple to say, hey, we're here because of the agent. We're here to build your business. And, and as you see in our mission statement, it's, it's very simple to understand. We do three things and, and we don't go beyond that. So, you know, I was flying back from L.A. last week. I'm sitting right next to a guy who works for Chick-fil-A. And Chick-fil-A is a prime example of a company that totally understands what they're in business for. And so they're very successful because of that. And by the way, we were flying on Southwest Airlines, which is another company that's very clear about why they're in business and why they've been so successful. And so clarity for any enterprise, if you really understand why you're there, as Gary likes to say, your big why, you know, if you really get that, then you're able to acquire the discipline that you need to go make things happen. You know, I, I use a little acronym, VDPR. V is vision. If you want to lose weight, if you don't, if you don't have the vision of what losing the weight means, you will never acquire the D, which is the discipline, to push yourself away from that extra bite, to turn down the dessert, to quit drinking those Dr. Peppers and start sipping on water and getting the discipline that it takes to be able to be successful with whatever vision that is. You with me? Because yeah. you will be you will become what you think about. You know, Earl Nightingale in his his video recording from forty five years ago where he talked about the greatest secret. And the greatest secret literally was you will become what you think about. And uh, to me, that's just the kind of clarity that you need. So if you want to lose weight and you weigh 200 and you want to get to 180, then 180 is your clear markers to where you're going to go. Then you get the discipline, the V, then you get the D. And for most people, for a lot of people, to acquire the discipline, what it means is planning. And I would tell you, in most of our businesses, it's writing things down. It's it's making the list of yeah. the things you got to do. The example I always give, and it's a great example. Why, when you're headed out of town for 10 days, are you incredibly successful the three days before you leave? And it's because you made a list. <laughs> you wrote yeah. it by necessity. You said, okay, here's the 10 things I got to get done for me to get on the plane and get over to Greece. And right. those three days are massively productive. What's the old axiom? What you write down tends to get done. <laughs> yeah, no, that's and so, great. And so my acronym, VDPR, vision, discipline, planning. And the R is you get the results. No, that, that, that's great. And I think the quote that you had on that is, I will have the success that I have planned, right? I read that, I read that somewhere, and that, that sums it all up. Yeah, planning for me, it's, 
a good friend of mine when I was in college, he was really a good guy, a good planner. I learned a lot of planning from him. Like he said, Joe, he said, when you make a list, think of it as being on a boat. He said, and I'm a sailboat guy. I have a sailboat out at Lake Travis. I've been sailing a long time. If you put the sail up, you get the power and it goes and it, and it goes somewhere. But without a rudder, no telling where you're going to end up. And the rudder is the vision that you sit yeah. down and you go, okay, here's where we're going to go with this. And it's the same as investing, Jim. When I sit down and counsel people on increasing their wealth, a lot of it starts with the vision first. Okay, where are you trying to go? What are you trying to do? And, you know, what does this mean to you? All of that is a big component to any type of investing that you're going to do. Because, and this is why I like real estate as an investment. Real estate's one of the few investments that's learnable. In other words, I was in this conversation with a guy last week talking about why is Tesla stock worth what it's worth? And the answer is nobody really knows. Because Tesla sells for seven times what General Motors sells for today. So they're both good companies, and certainly Elon's a smart guy. But that doesn't tell me why that stock would be seven times what General Motors stock is. In other words, there's a human element there that's a little hard to measure. Now, with real estate, most of the things that drive real estate values are typically public data, supply and demand, where the utilities are, jobs reports, city policies, schools, hospitals, growth patterns. All of that can be found and studied. So the thing I love about real estate as an investment vehicle is it's learnable. Now, granted, it helps to have an expert on your side who can look at all those variables and go, okay, this is good or this is bad or you need to be aware of this. And that's where a real estate professional comes in. I mean, there's a reason that we're able to help people because we deal with it all day long. We know what these variables mean for future values. But it's a lot easier to determine what's going on with a piece of real estate than it is a stock. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And and they don't tend to be as volatile, right? Because something could happen that all of a sudden Tesla's worth half of what it is today and, and no one really knows why. It's just because of the market, right? And, oh, the market. So that's why I'm, I'm all in on the real estate stuff as well. And speaking of real estate, let's transition to that. Can you give us some of your top lessons learned in real estate or investing that you've learned throughout your, your long career in in, well, real estate and, and business? Well, I will tell you one thing straight up, and this is probably one of the most important, and that is that of all the variables you're dealing with, timing is probably the most important variable, okay? Yes, location's important, but location pales in comparison to timing. So knowing whether you have a market that's going up or down or where you are in the cycle, and by the way, it's always in a cycle. Rarely does it go across in a straight line. And that's because human nature never changes. In other words, the supply and demand curve with multifamily is always out of sync. It's always out of sync. In other words, okay, uh, uh, Davenport, Iowa, they don't have enough multifamily. Okay, let's get down there, start building. Next thing you know, they're way over building, you know, the demand. Yeah. And then it's got to catch up, and then it's backwards. And, and so because of that, timing is a really important verb. And by the way, there's an old statement that investors use, and that is there's no such thing as a bad market. It's either a buyer's market or it's a seller's market. And so you just need to figure out who you are in that cycle. I had a Houston investor one time and he told me something, I'll never forget it. He said, you know, I've always sold too soon. And I thought about that and I thought, 
How wise a statement is that? Because the problem is if you wait for the top, the truth of the matter is once you hit the top, it's too late. Because if those prices start to go down, what does everybody do? <clears throat> oh, I'm going to wait. <laughs> I'm going to wait till it, you know, certainly it's going to get better, which is kind of interesting, Jim, because we've got issues now. The pandemic definitely changed some things permanently, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, office and how we work and where we work, that's going to change. There's no, you know, what I told people is for four years before the pandemic, all I was doing was driving to my office, grabbing a cup of coffee, turning on my computer, and talking on my mobile phone. Then the pandemic hit. Now I got to go home, but guess what? I took my laptop with me. I've got my mobile phone, and I'm not buying my coffee at Starbucks. I'm just going to the kitchen. But the reality is, I was doing the same thing. And yeah. that's why the nature of work and how this is going to change a little bit, it's going to take a little while to figure that out. And I can tell you that some of these big office buildings in downtown New York that are half full, I don't know that anybody's going to go back to them and work in an office. Because and, and it's a population thing, too. I'm a baby boomer. I'll be 70 in September. I'm used to working in an office. I'm used to getting up, going in. I'm at the office. We're having a good time. Then we, you know, we, have, we pinwheel out of here, and then I go home. Yeah. But a lot of the Generation X, they're not doing that. They don't even care about going in an office. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. And it's also it's a personality thing. As I often say, there's four basic personality styles. Two of those styles don't necessarily work that well at home, not by themselves. A CEO is not going to go home and run his enterprise from being home. <laughs> He's just not going to do it. There's a reason right. that Jamie Dimon with Chase is sitting down there right now in Midtown Manhattan on the 80th floor. But that's the nature. Now, an engineer, can I send an engineer home? Gladly. Right. They're tickled to death to be home. They got their headphones on. They got the coffee. They're working on their little drafting board. They don't care if they ever come in. And the truth of the matter is they may not. So there's going to be some adjustment that's going to have to occur in the next, I think, 24 months while everybody tries to figure that out. And so that's definitely going to impact big office buildings and the office product itself. Now, Things like apartments, I think they're probably going to do fine because when all these prices went up during the pandemic, okay, and it was the classic definition of inflation, way too many dollars chasing too few goods, especially with the supply chain issue we had. So all of a sudden, there's not near enough houses on the market. You got eight people lined up outside. What's going to happen to sales prices? They're going to go up. And they did. But. If I can't buy today, then what's my alternative to, to rent? And so I think a lot of the multifamily area is going to be fine. Yeah, there may be some markets where they'll overbuild a little bit, but there's way too many people trying to get into stuff. And, and the other thing with the interest rates right now, you know, and of course, you and I can appreciate this. My first house I bought in 1981 when I got married, and my interest rate was 13.5%. Wow. And it, it, it didn't stop me from buying, Jim. I still bought that mm -hmm. house. And by the way, I sold that house and made money on it many, many, many years ago. But yeah, would I rather buy it at three, three and a half? No question. But the United States government for 10 years did quantitative easing. And when you dump that much money in the marketplace, and then a pandemic shows up, well, what did they do? Instead of Don't putting more. billions in the market, they stuck trillions in the market. And then you had no supply. You couldn't get toilet flappers. So what's going to happen? They're going to go up in, in price. And so I don't think we're going to get back anytime soon to the cheap, cheap interest rates. They're not doing quantitative easing now. And in fact, what's interesting, 
if you go back and you study interest rates from 1972 to today, the average interest rate was 7.8%. If you go back to 1992 to today, the average interest rate is 5.98%. So the reality is, are we going to see 3%? I kind of doubt it. In fact, if I had to just from 50 years of being in this business, yeah. I'm betting that you're going to see rates that probably, I just don't think they're ever going to go below five. I think they're going to sit between five and seven, somewhere in that range. And the sooner people get used to the fact that it's not going to go down much, I think then they'll step back in and the, and the buyer's market will start to repair itself. The biggest issue we've got is we've got a lot of people out there with three, three and a half percent rates and they don't want to sell their homes. I don't blame. Them. Yeah. So it's going to hold prices. That that's why you're not seeing just wholesale drops with pricing right now. There's not enough homes out there. Right. And and as investors, you know, t- tell me what you think about this. It, it, it seems like you can still make money at seven percent interest rates or ten percent or even thirteen percent. The complications right now is the uncertainty that no one knows where interest rates are going to be in the future or how fast they're going to get there because the 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 speed that they raised rates was so out of line with historic norms that that seems to be have created a whole bunch of uncertainty and uncertainty makes it difficult for investors would you would you agree with that that you could make money at those higher interest rates you just got to do things a little bit differently maybe yeah well i mean you know it's going to be impacted by price location you have a lot of variables to a piece of real estate so if the rates now go up they won't cash flow as well until you can raise those Rent right. And, you know what? Ultimately, if you watch cycles, they have a way of balancing out over time. So, yeah, rates are now at six, probably actually six and a half percent. But the world's not likely going to stop. And jobs are still going to be created. People are still going to want to buy homes. They're still going to want to go to a retail store and buy things. So, uh, I'm just, I'm not as concerned about it just because I've got that historical perspective of knowing the rates were a lot higher than they are now. Yeah. So, yes, I think as everybody starts to realize that these rates are not going to jump back down super low, the values, certainly the cap rates change because of that. Uh, but I think you'll get back to a more normal market where everybody will get back to work and they're buying and selling. Right. And I want to jump back to something you said about timing, right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm a former financial advisor and, and, you know, it was always, oh, you can't time the market. And as a real estate investor, I kind of took a little bit of that with me where I just keep trying to allocate my capital regardless of what the market's doing because I don't know when we're at a high or a low. So if timing is one of the most important things when you're thinking as an investor, how do you know? If you're at the top, bottom, middle, or if it's a good place to time to sell or a good place to time to buy, how do you analyze that? Well, remember, there's a lot of variables to what creates real estate value. One of them is supply and demand. The other one might be jobs. If I looked at you and I said, okay, if I was going to invest in any state in America today, what two states for sure would come to mind? What would they be, Jim? I think people would say Florida and Texas. You got it. Ding! (laughs) Now, why do we say that? Because the jobs are going there. There's an influx population going there. They're low-tax states. They got the infrastructure. They have cheap prices. Texas has its own electrical grid. I mean, in other words, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where the real estate values are likely to grow the fastest. Okay? And that's why today... You know, I've I've discussed with you, we're doing a land fund where we basically go in, we buy land, we get it entitled, and then we flip it to the final developer. Only because we don't need to go do the vertical to make money. We can buy the land at a good enough price because I've got thousands of agents out there, and they're the ones that find us these deals. 
and they're off and off market deals. Well, bottom line is, where would we be looking? In the top 10 markets, and it's easy to define because again, the data is public. So Florida, North Carolina, Atlanta, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Texas, Northwest Arkansas, Arizona, uh, you know, I mean, Colorado, it, it's not hard to figure out where these variables are all working. Where is it harder? California, takes me six years to get a piece of land entitled. I can't even buy stuff there. Plus, it's, it's, a, it's a tough regulatory environment. So, you know, it, it, it again, it's public data. Yeah. You can read you can read Wall Street journals and figure out where to go put money. Now, if I'm in my own local community and I'm not gonna go to Texas to do the investment, I'm in Ohio, it's very easy to look around my local market and see what seems to be selling well and where there's demand for stuff. You know, the the in so many of these communities the middle class is getting priced out. First time buyers, affordable housing, Jim. I just put 32 acres under contract in Fort Myers, Florida, where we have the ability to go in there and change the zoning where the city of Fort Myers has told us, look, if you can build affordable housing, I'm talking the fireman, the teacher, you know, the these people. If you can build affordable housing, we're going to go out of our way to give you higher density. And it makes sense. Yeah. And so every community, listen, it, it, it's why I can't remember the last state that did it, Jim. I want to say it was um, Minnesota, but they're starting to eliminate the single family zoning laws where everything is zoned single family. And, you know, you can't put a granny flat in, you know, in the backyard. Right. And, they know they need the housing. So, and let me tell you, the state of Florida, on July the 1st, they have a new law going on the books that was pushed by the legislature to increase these densities for affordable housing projects. And I gotta tell you, it's incredible. It, it fast tracks any project you've got. Um, and the local community has to learn to work with it they, because the state basically stepped in and said, look, let's get smart. Yeah. If we don't get these housing units built, we're going to be in a world of hurt 10 years from now, 15 years from now. So we see a lot of movement in some states that really have a handle on what they're doing. Texas has less concern because we got plenty of land here. In Austin, you drove until you could afford it. That's That was the basic <laughs> rule. But, and you know, I mean, it's hard for California because they've got logistical problems geographically now. You know, they went right, they went left. Now they're trying to go up and down, and it's tough. Yeah. Just like the utilities. Water, uh, water, in my mind, is going to be one of the biggest issues we're going to have to really start paying attention to. I remember Clayton Williams. He was a oil guy in Texas, West Texas. I remember going to hear him speak 25 years ago at a chamber of commerce event. He said, Joe, he said, the issue's not oil. We've got plenty of oil. He said, the issue is water. And you can't, the only place that you can desalinate water on a cost basis that makes sense is on a cruise ship with 3,000 people. But other than that, desalination doesn't work. The numbers will not let you do that. And you can't manufacture water right. you know, at a cost, at a reasonable cost. So we're all gonna have to work with the water we got. I mean, it's crazy when I go to Arizona and I'm driving through a really nice, in Phoenix, really nice subdivision, where it's basically a rock Yard, you know, <laughs> colored rock and desert, oh, yeah. plants. and it makes all. The, and then I come back down here to Texas, and I'm driving. And we got St. Augustine grass, 
the water hog of the world of grasses in our front yards. And I'm thinking, this is just bass backwards. <laughs> I mean, that's got to change. I mean, I, right. you know, well, that, that's of grass. Yeah, and I've seen some yards starting with that, and then the homeowner association say you can't do that. So there's there's a lot of issues there. Um, but I, I want to go back to what you said about land, right? You're getting into um, this land fund, and I'm really interested in it. But why, of all the asset classes you could get into uh, with your expertise and your network, why are you getting into land? What What is in it for the LP investor, and, and how does a, a land project, a land fund, how does that work? Well, here's how the, – the key for me is the sourcing. I've got 200,000 agents across the world, so you can bet that that's a great little sourcing tool because yeah. they'll call me up and they'll go, Joe, my Uncle Ned's got 100 acres north of Raleigh, North Carolina. It's been in the family for 75 years, and he's thinking now's a good time to sell. And we're happy to buy it or JV it with him. I mean, we've got lots of options. But, uh, and here's a perfect example. We just did this one, Jim, two years ago. Same kind of call. North of Fort Myers, Florida, 169 acres. The guy was going to do an RV park. I love RV parks. I own some RV parks. They're, they're a great little investment. And... It didn't work, so the property had sat fallow, and one of our guys walked in the door and said, hey, we think you can buy this at a great price. We went over there, looked at it, and you could rezone it to single-family lots because the lots were 50 feet wide, which was perfect for a guy like D.R. Horton. And so what we did was we got it under contract, we did our due diligence to make sure we'd have no issue with the zoning. And then we go down to the D.R. Horton guys and go, hey, look what we got. And they're all over it. In fact, the first thing they said is, how did you find that? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, they pride themselves on knowing everything. Well, they don't have 200,000 agents across the world. And so what I did, I turned to Horton and said, well, would you buy it if we get this shovel ready for you? And they're all over it. They're, oh, absolutely. Here's the number. And so there's plenty of profit from what I bought it for and the 200000 of engineering, let's say, that we need to do. And by the way, we use Horton's engineers. Because we go to Horton, we put it on our contract. So literally, me and the investors have put up the money we got the land already under contract. We already know what we need to do. And that's what we do. And I don't need to do the vertical. I've been a builder. I've been a developer. I've done all that. I know that whole process. Building, if you do it full time, what's the old statement they used to say, Jim? If you're going to build five homes a year, you might as well build 50. Because it's as much trouble building the five as it's going to be building the 50, and you're not scaling yourself. So right. I don't need to be in the vertical construction, but I just don't need to do that to make money. And by the way, um, that project we did there in Florida, I think our internal rate of return on it was around 34%. I mean, you know, great return numbers. And yeah. without having to mess with any of the vertical construction, that it just it's it's just a smart way to do it. Now, that being said, many times we will find a property in distress. And what I find about developers is when they get into trouble, it's usually one of two things. They either run out of money or they run out of time. And commonly, they run out of time. In other words, they're, uh, they're going to buy it from the seller, and they get delayed at the city level. You know, the city can't get them a site plan or something like that. This happens all the time. I've got six projects I'm doing in the city of Austin right now. It's enough to drive you to drinking. You know, because they're, they're, you're dealing with bureaucracies day in, day out. It, it's very, very bureaucratic. They are not. 
in a hurry. And we are, but they're not. So you have to know when you're, whatever city you're in, you really got to know what it's going to take to get the project done. And then go get the expertise. I've got the expertise because I've got all these commercial guys all over America. They already know what engineer to call. They already know the city council. They already know the people we need to know. So it's just a tremendous advantage to do land like this. But sometimes we do pick up distressed properties. And I love them because typically they're very, very good deals. And just by us coming in and becoming a general partner with this developer, getting the money he needs so he can get the time, then we get to finish up the product, and it just gives us a lot of opportunities. Either we we cash out at that point, or we stay in the deal and we sell the product. It just gives us options. We did this, by the way, with a very high-end RV park in Fort Myers. Uh, and it turned out to be a really super, super deal, even with the pandemic. Pandemic hit us. We were selling these RV lots, but the average lot sale was 135000 I mean, you can make money doing that, and we made a lot of money on that little project. That's why I love the RV park space. Interesting. So we're, we're closing out here. I, I want to be respectful of your time. I really appreciate you spending so much time with us. Um, what, what, what's next? You said you're turning 70 in September. Are you going to keep on working? You seem to still have a lot of passion for real estate in this industry, and I love that. So what, what, what's next after the land fund? Well, let me tell you what's happened. We've had such such response to the land fund that I told my partners we're going to have to open up a couple more funds. So we're, <laughs> we're a long way from being finished with the land fund. Uh, we'll continue to work that for the next probably five years because that fund runs for eight years. But generally, you're in and out within about five to six years. But for right now, that's the biggest thing we're doing. And we're picking up a lot of neat property just because we're putting our feelers out there. I mean, the other day I had 10,000 acres in Belize. Like I think, Jim, I was telling you about that California walk in the door. We've got two miles of frontage on the Caribbean Sea. Well, you don't see that every day. <laughs> no. no, you don't. So we had, a, we had a guy come to us from, uh, uh, we have foreign investors now that are knocking on our door. And a gentleman, he came to us and he said, listen, I need to put $10 million into Portugal, so we got him connected up with our operating partner there in Lisbon, and we found him a six million dollar house that he's going to buy, and then he's going to put the other four million into properties in and around Portugal. So, so our brokerage business is just blowing up. It's it's yeah. crazy, but it's fun. Well, I can tell you're having fun. And as I said, I really appreciate your time here. I love the passion that you have for real estate and for business and being an entrepreneur. Just an amazing journey, an amazing story. Thank you so much. If people are interested in the land fund, uh, what's the best way they can uh, they can get information about that? What they can, they can email me at joe at joewilliams.land. Perfect. I will put that in the show notes. And again, thank you so much for being on the podcast. This is a great episode and I love catching up with you and hope to see you again uh, at the next family office event where we're both at because I think that's that's where we met and, uh, and had some good time. So hope to do that again. I'm looking forward to it, Jim. Good luck to you, man. Well, that was probably one of my favorite episodes, just listening to Joe. I could listen to Joe all day long. He's just got so many good nuggets of information and just such a positive, happy attitude. He built this amazing business, Keller Williams, by just flipping the script, right? Empowering his agents so that they felt like they were business owners and were in fact business owners. And each step of the way, they just kept coming up with new ideas to empower those agents. And that just exploded their business. And there's so many ways you can take that into your own life, whether it's business or personal, and just empower the people around you and give them the education and support that they need, but let them be in charge of their destiny. Let them do their own thing. And the, you know, the the, set, the mission statement for, for Keller Williams, build careers worth having, businesses worth owning, lives worth living. And I think that just 
encapsulates everything that that Joe was talking about in this in this episode. So that was really really fantastic. And you know, he talked about the stable table, building your own brand, VDBR, all of these things, and and the stories that he tells. It really it has everything to do with real estate and has nothing to do with real estate. It's a lot about mindset and setting yourself up for success and being places, using your network, right? He's starting this new land fund. Well, as he said, he has 200,000 people out there scouting for land for him. Now, they're not spending all day looking for land for Joe, but they're doing the regular jobs. And if they come out and they find a piece of land, they're like, oh, I can send that to, to Joe Williams. He works at Keller Williams, naturally. And so that just gives him a huge advantage. But he got that advantage from what he built and how he, again, empowered people and put everything in the right place. So now you can tell he is still passionate. He still loves what he does. And he doesn't even have time to do all the other stuff because he's so into his business. And that is he's not working, right? He's living. And that's fantastic. So really appreciate him coming on the show. Honored that he would spend his time with Left Field Investors. And, you know, really hope to run into him again at some of the Family Office Club events because that's that's where we met. And, and he goes to a few of those. And and he just he's just great to, to hang out with and, and chat with. Just a regular guy. He built this fantastic, amazing, you know, Fortune 100 company. And he's just a regular guy nice guy. So really appreciate him. Hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you next time in the left field.